All right, so welcome back. Uh, we're uh, now at lecture 12. We're, we're getting close to the end of the course. Um, my strategy is just to touch on lots of topics. I, I noticed that a student of mine about six years ago wrote her master's thesis on an aspect of today's topic. It's extremely involved, and I think if you, if you what I'd like to do today is just to, is to touch on some of the aspects of heterogeneity <coughs> and their implications for uh, search, uh, still random search. And then after that, we'll move into, into this, this kind of new area of directed search, um, just because it's, uh, it's uh, probably the, 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 new, the new frontier. But it's, at the same time, I'd like to, to signal that heterogeneity is, a, is an extremely powerful tool. It's so powerful that you can almost uh, generate any, any result you want. So it's, it's, we need to have some discipline on the exercise. So I'll. I'll explain that in a few seconds. So uh, we'll summarize last week's lecture. I'll repeat a lot of things because I think it's, um, some of you weren't here and maybe um, you have questions. There's, um, I'll start by talking about the, um, the interesting implications of the burdett mortensen model in its pure form where there's, there's no heterogeneity at all with the agents <coughs> involved, either the firm or the or the, uh, the worker, this has um, fascinating implications. We generated an, an endogenous offer distribution under certain behavioral, behavior, uh, behavioral assumptions regarding the firms that are posting wages and posting them in sort of a, in a um, uncoordinated um, <coughs> fashion. And then um, this means that Basically, if you're unemployed in that model, it's uh, not because you're inefficient, because you're just like everybody else. If you got a job, uh, you were lucky. And if you got a job and held it for a long time and um, maybe got successive wage offers that you accepted, um, if you take the interpretation that the point on the support is a firm, then um, you know, your, your uh, increasing wage over time uh, means you're at a larger firm and your wage is going to be higher. So it's, but it's all luck. It's not because of skill or effort or whatever. And that's um, not disturbing. It's just a sign that the model is very powerful. Um, the next step would be to add some minimal form of heterogeneity that could generate even more results that look like reality. Because the problem of Burdett Mortensen in its pure form is that it generates a a wage distribution that has a positive second moment, but it doesn't look like anything we see in the data. Okay, I made that clear last time. And then if I have some time, I'll, I'll start talking about uh, what is called uh, directed search and competitive search models. Okay, so last time we had a, we had, um, we reviewed once again this sort of, uh, this concept of taking the search model as a transform of, of the offer distribution into the observed distribution, thinking about wage posting as a way of um, generating a distribution, even though workers are, firms are the same, workers are the same. Uh, you need to have some sort of um, monopsony power. That at the very instant the match is formed, the, the, the firm has a bit of, um, sway over the way the, the, the surplus is, is distributed. Okay, so that's just, a, that's just an assumption, and you can just as well assume that workers have the, the power to name a wage that the firms would have to pay, and you could, we just don't observe that in reality, so we've, we've taken the Bewley finding that, we're, that firms tend to set wages, uh, even Nash bargaining is, is, is less, um, or bargaining is less uh, frequently observed. So if you take that as a given, uh, as in a behavioral assumption, you're able to generate this distribution. This is the, the solution to the, to the diamond paradox that we described. This, the fact that under normal conditions where workers can, and firms can sort of learn from engaging in, in encounters with employers, you did, and, and if, if workers' behavior and uh, preferences are learnable by, the, by firms, you'd end up having a, a degenerate distribution, the diamond paradox, 1971. Diamond paper. Uh, this is a solution to that. So we can actually have a non-trivial, non-degenerate distribution um, that is offered by identical firms. Okay. Now, what I didn't get to last time was to talk about the distributive 
um, implications of that, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so I'll, maybe I should ask you what you what you think what you think that might be, and what what me, what seems to be obvious. If everyone's the same, right, and you put them together, and the only reason that wages evolve that are different from each other is just pure luck. Um, was there an obvious policy intervention that you might consider? To because it's inefficient. In some sense, it's inefficient. The, the social planner would just match workers with firms, and and then maybe f have some other criteria on how to distribute surplus between the two parties. Any ideas? And what would be the effect of a minimum wage if you introduced a minimum wage in this model? It just kind of shift the distribution at the bottom of the line. Okay, it would certainly make workers unwilling to accept anything less than the minimum wage because the worker knows that's got to be the lower bound of the support. If if at anything, it might even be above. You'd have to work the model out. But um, what does that imply for efficiency? It's a question that's interesting. Well, the social planner would. If you're a social planner, what's the, suppose you're an omniscient social planner, so you don't even have to deal with the friction. What would be the efficient solution? If you were omniscient, you knew everything, so you didn't have a, you didn't have a bathtub, you just had x-ray vision, you could see everything. What would you do if you could overcome the friction? Yeah, trivial, right? And you'd have, you'd have nirvana, but we don't have it, <laughs> okay? So the frictions are, are key. They generate inequality despite identical agents. And this is a great achievement. I want to keep, keep, you know, keep you aware of that. Uh, but the central planner um, really omnisciently would just match everybody. Okay, and then the question is how does she, how does she redistribute or how does she distribute the, the you might say, well, I believe in equality, the, the firm gets half, the worker gets half, everyone's equal, that's possible, right? You might say, well, maybe it depends on bargaining power, maybe it depends, and what's bargaining power in this model, the social planner has all the power. <laughs> so it's really arbitrary, it's completely arbitrary. Um, on the other hand, in this model, you have two sources of potential inefficiency. You have the match, within the match, how you allocate the surplus and whether the match arises, but you also have um, this notion of unemployment because workers in the Burdett Mortensen model turn down jobs. Okay, they turn down jobs. And if, remember B, we define B as the, the opportunity cost of time. And in this classic model that we worked on the whole week last week and the week before, we just set B equals WR because the model predicts that if the incidence of arrival, job arrivals on the job and in unemployment are equal. Remember, the, the distribution is assumed to be the same anyway. F is the same. That's, that's again, another issue you could take up with the model, but if the, if the, uh, the distribution of wage offers on the job and, off, and, and in work are the same, and the arrival rates are the same, then the model predicts that your reservation wage is equal to the value of time outside the labor market, okay? So that means that if the minimum wage is raised above that, then that will create unemployment because the worker knows they can get WR, which is greater than B, which is efficient. So that's kind of not so great. So the minimum wage above B creates unemployment, and unemployment is macroeconomically inefficient. Even though within, you still don't have a, a, cl a clear idea. On the other hand, if you keep pushing the minimum wage above B, the, the distribution becomes different, has a different shape, and it implies that basically along the distribution, workers are getting higher wages given that they have a match. So it has a redistributive element, even though that's not efficiency in the strict sense, it's a redistributive aspect. So changing the shape of the wage distribution in equilibrium um, 
is also often mentioned as a target or as a policy target for, for labor policy makers. Right? So it could increase unemployment. That's macroeconomically inefficient because some matches will not take place. So GDP will be lower. GDP per capita will be lower. Um, but also you'll have maybe some, for some ideological reason, you might be in favor of giving more wages to the worker. You might say, well, it's not fair that workers have high wages, so I want to give high wages to everybody, you know? Um, <laughs> because it's all a matter of luck anyway. It's cumul this model predicts that if you have high wages in this model, it's because you've been cumulatively lucky, right? You've survived a lot of, of, of being bombarded with a potential dissolution of your match, and you've survived, and then you've gotten offers from above, so that pulls you up, right? So, it's, uh, so you might not like that. But again, the model doesn't say anything about inequality, doesn't say anything about inequality aversion. The policymaker may not like that. But you should be aware that introducing the minimum wage has two dimensions. It, it raises unemployment. And if the minimum wage is above the opportunity cost of time, it will create this, this, this macroeconomic inefficiency, but it'll also change the shape of the distribution. It'll change the, the rate of de de redistribution between the capitalist, with the own, firm owner, and the worker. Yeah? But then wouldn't it be uh, most efficient if WR was zero? Because then F of WR is also zero, and then you can maximize that term there? Well, F, I mean, if, if WR below zero is not going to is not going to be binding, so we have this classic result in 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 the classic Marshallian view of the minimum wage that if it's below the intersection of labor demand and supply, then nothing doesn't have any effect. It's the same idea here. It's just not relevant. Okay, but that's not the case if people are different. So that's what I'm going to get to. So the, the, the heterogeneity is the is the next. Step. I'm trying to seduce you into thinking about heterogeneity. Okay, yeah. You mentioned that. If the social planner wants to maximize output yeah, per capita. But isn't it also an efficiency aspect how much they are getting the workers from this output? It's not only the matching. Maybe, maybe they are matched, but with a, a very bad terms. OK, but that's, that's, a, that's outside the model. I mean, here, the, everyone's the same, right? And if you have that, we'll get to that. That's possible. Mm -hmm. But right now, we're, we're in this rarefied, simple world where everyone's identical. And again, we thought that was kind of interesting. And then this fantastic, <laughs> this, this wonderful paper basically goes after that idea, right? So, I mean, there are lots of things you can do with it. And this is, all, this is all 20 years ago. So in the meantime, we've had lots of, I mean, the thing kind of stalled. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. The paper I gave you to read, the one you're supposed to really take seriously, is, is kind of at the, at the edge. And beyond that, in the meantime, we've had, we've had even more progress. But, more progress in directed search. Okay, so the wage is, has this redistribution function within the match, and that's why in the model it's a bit, you know, we know in economics there's always a marginal, there's an inframarginal or within match issue, how much effort, um, can you control effort by offering a higher wage? Can you offer like little bonuses and things like that, given that the match exists? That's not in this model. So it's really, this is a super extensive margin model. It's really about, about just putting people together with workers, uh, with firms, and seeing what happens. OK, so this is kind of the basic starting position. Um, and you can see why firms don't like minimum wages because in any sort of, it's a very robust result. Is if you raise the minimum wage, you're going to reduce profits across the distribution, not just at the margin. It's not just, and that's why a lot of these labor, uh, my, my colleagues in empirical labor mar, uh, economics have, have stared a lot at the, at the uh, in a sense of regression discontinuity, uh, you know, in econometrics, looking at the, at the behavior of firms around the, around the, the the critical point where the minimum wage is, is binding, it's probably not a great 
strategy because firms can, I mean, equilibrium adapts, not just the firm's individual behavior, but the, the equilibrium will adapt. Firms will change their optimal wage post under those conditions in this model. And then there's no reason to think that you'll have this huge jump there. You're just, you may actually push the whole distribution. So you really have to look at maybe the stochastic dominance of the distribution before and after the introduction of the minimum wage. So that's just kind of a random remark on my part. Okay, so let's just summarize. Wage inequality is unfair because it's bad luck. Um, you know, it's really even more important for the for policy to look at the source of the frictions because clearly if you can change, we called it alpha, the arrival rate, if you can increase, like if you can think of, think of the Hartz III reforms, increasing access to, um, to data banks. Workers go, you go to, a, if you're unemployed in Germany, you go to the uh, employment agency and they, you sit down with this, with, now they call them they call, they call the, the people clients, you know, they're not unemployed people anymore, they're clients. <laughs> and they get, um, they have service uh, personnel and you get this uh, computer that's really powerful so I can tell you all the job availability in the whole country. So I can say, why don't you just move to Munich? <laughs> it's really expensive. Um, and that uh, has um, consequences for this model, it just reduces it increases uh, alpha and would reduce the, um, um, change the shape of the distribution of the wages, right? It would make more matches come about. And maybe it's not clear that you want to reduce the natural attrition in matches, um, but maybe there's an efficiency that led to that, you know, and uh, if that's the case, uh, changing that would also change Unemployment and therefore change employment because if you're not unemployed in this model, you're employed, right? So it's a, it's a. Okay, so the next step would be to maybe think about heterogeneity. I'm just going to push one dimension uh, in this class uh, with a, with a reference to a much more difficult problem of of firm heterogeneity. Okay, just reminding you, we you know we we get the spike result. Go back to the model when alpha one and alpha zero are different. Okay, so you can let Alpha one go to zero, um, and we end, end up having uh, this spike issue. All the probability mass collects at the worker's um, valuation of time. The market friction gives us this, and the same, uh, you know, if, if you if you increase alpha one, you get closer to the competitive outcome. So you're kind of chipping away at this monopsonistic competition problem, this monopsony power, which is the, you know, it's a source of, <laughs> it's, first off, it's realistic. The reason I like this is it's realistic, and it's, it's very much in, in the data. Um, it's Joan Robinson, but Joan Robinson in the 21st century, right? It's kind of, remember Joan Robinson, what she said, <laughs> she also said something about, I mean, she wrote a book on imperfect competition, you know, and especially, in labor markets, and I thought that was really an amazing comp uh, contribution of hers. So the, the the problem with this model is it generates these this lousy looking G, um, and then we have to figure out ways to make it work, because the density of, of of G, remember G is the cumulative distribution, so DG is the is the density. It's increasing throughout in W, so it's really not doesn't look like a log normal or log Parisian distribution that we would see in the, in the, in the US data, the German data on, on a wage, right? Okay, so that, that's um, this changing sign of the first derivative of the CDF is kind of the, is the stumbling block. That's not, a, that's not the end of the world. I mean, you know, if we can be clever, um, obviously, the homogeneous agent doesn't work. I mean, it gives us the, the spread, but it doesn't give us the right distribution. So the secret might be um, to induce some sort of introduce some sort of heterogeneity. So I, I'm going to make I'm going to ask you to look at Rogerson more carefully again. I keep saying that because it's really exam relevant, prüfungsrelevant. Burdett Mortensen is hard to read because the notation is completely wrong. I mean, it's completely off. It's just very difficult to follow, especially if you've been taking this course. And um, not to say that the course is right, but I'm, I'm trying to fit into the, the standard 
notation. I use the Rogerson et al. Nota notation. So I've kind of reversed engineered it. At the end of the, the lecture, I'll give you a table, and you can, using the table, you can sort of, <laughs> it's like a, you can reverse engineer what they've done. Um, and uh, we, they've, the literature's moved beyond this paper, but I just want to uh, make you aware that, and the, the most important set of papers is uh, by Bonton, uh, Robin, and uh, Vandenberg. They, um, I think they did the, a solid job trying to um, fix this in terms of both worker and firm heterogeneity. And that creates a lot of interesting issues, a lot of potential inefficiency, a lot of monopsony power. But to get there, we'd have to really go slowly. And I said I had this, this um, PhD student who took my course um, when she was a master's student, but her master's thesis was a really excellent thesis. Um, it's a lot of work. So I'm going to do the easy one first, and maybe if you like it, you can look at the other, at the other thing. Okay, so um, two possibilities. One is that, that workers are different in terms of their valuations of leisure. So we can make each person a little bit different. I think I alluded to this last time, starting on it, but I, I'm going to go into some detail. And the other is, uh, well, and you can have firms being identical, and the firms basically have a, constant interest in getting uh, workers through the, in the door, but um, the, the readiness of workers to accept a, wa a wage offer differs because different ha workers have different valuations of time, and you can either call that laziness or you can call it uh, you know, alternative duties at home, I have children to take care of, I've got an old, old uh, relative to, to worry about, um, or I just like to, to read books and hang out in bars and watch football games, that, you know, soccer games. <laughs> so these are I mean, no judgment at all. It's just a fact that people are different. Thank goodness, and that means that maybe um, this new distribution I'm going to introduce would could help us uh, fix fix the um, the the resulting G that we get. Because remember, G we can observe, and G does not look like the G in this in this model. Okay, so let's let's do uh, let's not assume that workers are different in terms of their productivity, or that firms are different. Because you might imagine, and what's what's the? It's hard to know what really is productivity. Is it um, you know once the firm worker get together, something happens, and uh, you can assume that firms are just different. So we all want to work for Google, but we don't want to work for you know Zolando. <laughs> okay, <laughs> if that's the case, then um, there'll be workers at both places, but the firms posted wages will be different. The, word, the firm's wage posting strategy will be different. That's a harder problem to, to think about. We'll just think about workers being different. So B is different. Everyone has their own individual B. And Burdett and Mortensen certainly uh, did both. And we'll just assume that B has a CDF like the wage offer in, the, in this uh, model or the wage observed wage distribution. We'll call it capital H. And it's got a support that it's bounded, and lower, the lower bound, B lower bound is like, uh, really not very much. So if you, if you you know if, if you're going to work, if you can get at least three euros an hour, and there are people like that. In fact, around the hearts reforms, there were a lot of people like that, um, and you have maybe people who, for whatever reasons, maybe they have just independent wealth. Uh, in, they're independently wealthy, or they um, have really lots of valuable things to do on the side. They would have B upper bar. So everything is between that, and it's a the usual assumptions. You know, cap H of B lower bar is equal to zero. Cap H of B upper bar is equal to one. And the derivative is always positive because the density is the marginal contribution to the CDF. Okay? The cool thing about this model is that if you're unemployed, um, it kind of means you're, um, it's really hard to know whether you're out of the labor force or whether you're unemployed. It's you're just not working because there is no explicit out of the labor force, um, but it gives you a different flavor. Um, of people out of the labor force. People out of the, we would think about people out of the labor force, people are rarely unemployed. They can always become employed, but it depends on an offer that they'll probably never 
ever get. So suppose you're a really excellent programmer and you think you're as good as, as uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and <laughs> whatever, or you think you're as clever as he is. He's probably not a great programmer, but if, if you think he's, you know, you're just as talented as he, are, he is, and you're, you're only going to work if, and since you made a lot of money already in, in your past, you say, I'm only going to work if I get an offer like his. Okay, so that person is going to be unemployed most of the time. That's going to be the bottom line of this model. And that person is different from someone who's just hungry and desperate, wants to work, has a very low B. Okay, and this is kind of the, the um, when you go back to the beginning of the course, we talked about the reservation wage strategy. Everyone kind of personalizes this model and thinks, well, what's, what's, my, what's my B? Well, this model takes that seriously. We're going to add all these people together. Before we were talking abstractly, this, this is any given worker now, this is a particular um, worker. At the same time, um, productivity is by assumption the same. Okay, so any unemployment re reflects some private valuation of time that exceeds um, the, um, the options that are, that are made available, which is not inefficient because I mean, that's one thing we have to really be clear about is that if, if you reject the job um, because you have a high B, it doesn't mean that it's inefficient. It means that you know, we respect your valuation, you value your time very highly, and then therefore it uh, wasn't right for you. Okay, so we'll, we'll continue the assumption before alpha equals alpha 1 equals alpha 0, and um, that sort of cuts to the quick. We'll have a common, common support uh, for the offer, <coughs> the accepted offer um, that'll be equal to B. But this, this means that every worker has her own individual reservation wage. That's obvious. And again, this is... This is, uh, I say it's ILO un unemployment, but it's also ILO unemployment, which means that workers can have different reasons not to be available for work. Because the ILO question is, are you available for work? Have you searched for work? And this is a person that may not be available. You know, I'm not looking today. I'm not just not searching, even though if someone knocked on my door, took me to lunch, and made an offer of 300,000 euros a, a year, I would take it. Okay, but I'm just not really super available. I'm not really... Uh, I'm kind of searching in the sense that, yeah, but it's, it's, it's tricky, right? It's, it's because a lot of people don't expend a lot of effort. And how would you categorize them? Well, this model tells you exactly how you categorize them. So unemployment has this uh, mixing. So you're really thinking about non-employment in this model. Um, so we can now use calculus to actually evaluate the measure Okay, because remember, we're talking about heterogeneity on the, on, in this dimension B. So the, the mass of, of unemployed workers that would be willing to work accepting a wage offer that's less workers that have um, willing to accept a wage offer less than or equal to W would be this integral from B lower bound to, 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 to W, to this offer, conditional on the F distribution. So these are all the, this is like the equilibrium rate of unemployment, the equilibrium uh, rate of unemployment for all the workers who have, mar have valuations of their time that are, up, that are equal to or up to W. Okay, so the um, total unemployment would be the integrating over the entire range of B, so the entire population um, of, of workers in the, in the economy, because all the, the, uh, the economy's heterogeneity is summarized by this uh, interval B lower bound to B upper bound, or B lower bar to B upper bar. Okay, so you can see that if you, if you make, um, if you just take a, as you push, if you push B to the top and, and take the evaluation of the, of the unemployment rate of those workers that are really, really picky, so the ones that are really waiting for the, the ultimate offer would have very, very high B, and their unemployment rate would be almost one. It's going to be, it's going to be as cl arbitrarily close to one. Okay, so we have this range of, so, the, so you've, you've basically pushed, um, you've made unemployment a mixture of 
of all those um, workers who basically have not encountered an offer that exceeds their uh, reservation wage. And then, of course, they can, once they're, they're in a sort of a private labor market in a sense, they're still getting the, the offers on the job and everything else, but they're, when they're unemployed, they're, um, they're always basing their offers um, on this um, personalized uh, valuation of time. So it's interesting. That pushes all the interesting, inter interesting action into H. We've actually managed to, because we have this horrible looking F under homogeneity, now we're going to try to see how, how well can, can H account for what we observe. Okay? So that, and that's kind of, that was the, the agenda of this literature for the next 20 years. Yeah. Is F of E alpha bar equal to 1? Yeah, in general, sure, of course, still. Because V alpha bar can also be it's, equal it's, to the highest weight that's well, in the model. W upper bar is the upper bound of the offer distribution, and it'll be also the upper, the upper bound of the, of the observed wage distribution. And that's endogenous. It will fall out and we'll derive it, just as we did before. Okay, so it'll be a more complicated expression. Remember, it was, had the square root in term in. Well, it's very similar. <laughs> but it's got this H. So H is this kind of extra degree of freedom. Um, all right, so the, again, you can use the same argument to get to, get to uh, I mean, we're, we're doing the, the same dance we did before. H determines G, and then under what conditions can, a, uh, can market behavior by firms take G and, and lead it to, to, a, to, to F? F to G, G to F, given H. H is exogenous. Okay, so this is uh, the same the same things we had before, but now we have um, the outflow from jobs paying less than or equal to W is going to also depend on the the wage offer distribution that a worker would face under this under these conditions. So U is conditional on that. The unemployment rate for any given type of worker. Um, up to and including this U upper bar will depend on um, this homogeneous offer distribution that the, the model assumes right now. So again, the model will take the mass of firms and they'll compete with each other in some way and produce uh, an, an F. Workers accept the F, they take the F as given, and uh, accept or reject jobs based on that. Okay, so we have the same equality at each point. And um, again, dummy variable of integration is just to make that integral because you're integrating over all the, the different uh, potential um, unemployment rates because each, each type B has its own unemployment rate. And therefore, um, that flow equality condition means we have to Sum over, summarize, or sum or integrate over all the different um, like sub labor markets. Even though the the sub labor markets for the firm is is not an issue because the firm doesn't um, the firm just wants to produce, right? Just wants to find someone who wants to work. But for the for our analytic purposes, you have to sum or, you have to sum up over all these different uh, infinitesimally different. Um, valuations of time. So that's the cool thing about this model. It's really, it's just amazingly cool. So you can derive, you can solve this just like we did before. So now we have, we have G as a function of um, F and taking into consideration heterogeneity where the unemployment rate, this U, is a function of, of implicitly a function of H, of the distribution of of, heter of heterogeneous agents at different valuations of time. Okay, so think of think of the wage as, you know, the or the distribution of wages is kind of the is the aggregation of all the successful offers that firms made and workers didn't turn it down. And firms have to firms are going to have to figure that out. And that's the next part of the, the model would be to ha how would firms behave knowing that. Um, if they 
post wages that are too low, they're going to get a lot of rejections just because there are a lot of people out there who are very choosy. And, you know, they'll have to take into consideration that. Or the, the equilibrium will reflect the, um, the shape, of the, the curvature of, of response to a small change in the wage um, at any point in that distribution. Remember, each firm has single wage post. Okay, so you can think of the of the wage itself as being a firm, or you can think of you know one man one firm uh, type of situation where the the, the resulting distribution it reflects the the number of or the, the the density of firms at that wage, or the or you can think of it as the size of a firm. So there's no the, just like before, we we can't really distinguish between the size of the firm at the wage or the number of firms at the wage. It's just a, an equilibrium. Okay, so I already said this. We have a, Remember Pisarides in chapter 7? We talked about it. We didn't really do it, but um, it's, it's similar, but this is kind of a more rigorous way of doing it, I think, because uh, it, it generates the, um, this non-trivial wage distribution. In the Pisarides model, there's a single wage. We actually have a distribution of wages. Okay. Um, but we're still not there yet because we have to derive F. And the right way to do this is to use exactly the same strategy as before. So firms, you know, they all sort of, um, they're in the dark and they have to think, okay, which, if I post a high wage, I'm going to have a high retention rate, but I'm also not going to make many prof much profits. And my retention rate will be based on the shape of H as well as um, this underlying friction. And if I offer a really cheapo wage, if I offer something that's very close to B, uh, lower bar, I'm not going to get much of anything. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get many, I'm going to get um, few workers that accept, and I'm also going to have a, a fairly rapid rate of disappearance of, of firms, of workers at my, or high rate of loss of, 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 uh, of workers at that low wage. So using the same arguments, this sort of continuity argument, you can, you can show that the equilibrium wage distribution for this type of model uh, will look very similar, except it's got this H embedded in the, in the square root term, in the numerator and the denominator. Okay, And uh, in the denominator, it's, it's evaluated at the lowest wage post, because the firms will have a, a lowest um, sustainable wage post that's consistent with equal expected profits across all the potential strategies the firm can do, which is also equal to the um, reservation wage um, strategies of the workers um, in the unemployment pool. Because remember, if you're, if you're making an offer to the unemployed people, you have to recognize that they have the distribution of willingness to work, and that will push you away from the lowest so B lower bar may not actually be in the, be in the, um, in the set of possible wage offers. It's something you have to solve for, okay? Now, if you look carefully, is this a valid CDF? Well, um, we, have to, we have to do the test. You know, is it, we know it's gonna be zero at B, um, or it's gonna be zero at W, W up uh, lower bar, so that's kind of a, that's, um, that's a miss, that's a typo. I'm going to fix that right now. I'm going to go in here, I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to put it here. So if you want, you can take that out, um, but you don't have to. It's not an efficient use of your time. <laughs> okay. All right, so in a sense, we, we've got this new degree of freedom as long as the, the first derivative is positive, and we know that the first derivative of h is positive. Okay, so this is going to be fulfilled. We, we can control the rate at which h is increasing by just assuming a different distribution of h. But it turns out that reasonable distributions of h can lead to reasonable wage offer distributions, and therefore to wage, ex accepted wage distributions. So this is kind of the salvation of Burdett Mortensen, and they actually did this in their paper, so it's not like they, you know, the paper probably took 
10 years to get accepted because it took them a long time to figure this out. Okay, so yes, we, we've, we've had a mild success story here. <laughs> the cool thing about this, however, is a bit more because um, in the other, in the other um, setup, in the pure heter homogeneous agent uh, outcome, uh, given, the given the frictions, the outcome is not inefficient. The introduction of a minimum wage does not correct any monopsony power. It's just pure redistribution and it creates unemployment. But now we have an inefficiency because the social planner would basically say, I'll match anyone who has a productivity, um, or has a valuation of their time that is less than Y. That is the socially efficient, right? The socially efficient uh, planner solution. That's the omniscient planner. But if, if the planner has this friction to deal with like we do, it's still gonna say there are some inefficient things going on in this model. Okay, some matches are not taking place, even though I have workers who are, um, have a low valuation of time and we have firms that are productive, we can't get them together because of wage posting. Wage posting is an inefficient response to this problem. Okay? So that's kind of interesting, right? That's, a, that's, a, that's like a Joan Robinson aha moment. I mean, we figured out that we can do better than the market. And it's because of the the strategy chosen by firms, even though firms aren't colluding, if firms are colluding, it can get even worse. The inefficient would be much larger. So if you can imagine firms could sort of hold hands and have an employer's association, et cetera, that would make things even worse. But even in this model where firms are literally not coordinating, they're only coordinating on the sense of being able to survive in an expected profit sense, right? That's the, that's the thing. Okay, so. The cool thing about Mortensen, Burdett and Mortensen is they say we can actually think of this as being, um, we can calculate the extent of this inefficiency by saying, okay, suppose if we forced firms to post the wage equals marginal revenue product and let them search and match, uh, then all matches would arise. You wouldn't have this equilibrium distribution of wage offers that yield expected profits that are equal. You'd have every firm forced to post Y and, and basically give all the surplus to the work. Maybe you have, maybe you have some redistribution back to the firm in some, in some sense. But that would be kind of a, a measure of, of um, efficient unemployment in this model. Okay, I thought it was kind of interesting because it's, you know, it's, again, economists have, are free to think. And we can think in ways that are not necessarily market uh, oriented or mar pro-market, and I, it's an interesting conclusion. If you subtract that unemployment that naturally arises under the, under the conditions where you, firms basically always post the pro product, marginal product of, product of workers, that difference is a measure of inefficient frictional unemployment. Okay, and they call it excess unemployment. And this is what maybe um, some policy could try to reduce, and you could actually evaluate that. Again, it's all based on the worker's valuation of time. It's not based on the productivity of workers. So this is something that we can actually, you know, take our model and calibrate it and estimate it, um, use data to calculate it, et cetera. Okay, so that's, the, that's all I'm going to say about heterogeneous workers. Now, the, the literature on heterogeneous firms is is even more complex in the sense that it's, uh, um, well, in the, in the original paper, um, Burdett and Mortensen took a two-point productivity distribution, so they assumed that there were two types of firms. There was like the productive <coughs> firms and the non -pro less productive firms, more productive firms, and they basically have to compete with each other in a wage posting strategy, and they were able to derive a result there. Well, that's not completely satisfactory, so they, um, Bonton, Robin, and Vandenberg have, have uh, pushed a continuous distribution of productivity, and you can derive the optimal wage posting strategy under those conditions with homogeneous workers and then with heterogeneous workers. So you can actually integrate both. But this is not something I'm going to torture you with today <laughs> because we have to get finished with the course. 
if you want to write your master's thesis on it, fine. Uh, it's an interesting exercise. Okay, so I've left a little blank here for, for you guys, if you want. There's a bunch of other expressions and formula that you can um, go back to my notes or to Rogerson, um, Scheimer Wright, and, and make a connection. But just to give you a hint, the, the paper has a cr incredibly, I mean, it's a great paper. It shows, it also shows that if you're interested in doing academics, you sometimes you really have to be persistent. The good ideas do, do eventually win. And this is probably one reason why Dale Mortensen got the Nobel Prize, because um, he did push it, and he actually published a book showing that Danish data can be explained using this, this type of model. Okay, but the, the, the notation is terrible, and it's, there's a lot of, I mean, just, it's just, it's terrible in the sense that they just don't use standard notation that other people do. Of course, they would say, this is my notation. If Burdett were here, we'd probably say, it's my notation, and I did it first. But um, for our course, and for making connection to the other papers, you might need this little conversion table. So there it is. The left-hand side of each little table is what, the, what those guys call it, and the right-hand side is what we call it, okay? And this is for the formula. So if you're interested, in, if you're really interested in reading this, you can check out the, check out the, um, the expressions for the reservation wage and for the distribution, et cetera. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. So now we'll move to a different, uh, I mean, you'll, you'll be grateful that we didn't do the <laughs> heterogeneous productivity games. <laughs> but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not conceptually very difficult. It's just, uh, I mean, you get the point. So we want to move on and talk about um, directed search. And uh, remember, directed search is, is, a, um, is a notion where I can actually there are many lakes I can, I can go search in, and each searching in one kind of excludes the other. So you can't do both. And again, this is going back to the idea of sequential search. There's some sort of cost of, of visiting a market and, uh, or visiting a stand in the, in the cheese market. Um, or, and here it's actually visiting a market, so it's not just it's not just going to, a, to get a, a price quote, it's actually engaging for some, you know, some, sort, of, some sort of process. <clears throat> and that's called directed search. And the combination of, of that kind of strategy with firms that are actually, they know that, and they're uh, reacting by declaring a wage in some sort of way that's, com that's feasible with commitment, okay, so they, they can't just cheat and change their mind, uh, is called competitive search. And it goes back to a very famous paper in the Journal of Political Economy in 1997 by Aspen Moon. And in the meantime, there's many, many other uh, papers that have worked on this. This is a new article by Wright um, and co-authors in the Journal of Economic Perspectives in 2021, I think, or 22. Um, the idea is simple. You got these, uh, you've got workers choosing to go to different markets and firms knowing that and also actively choosing. And these sub-markets different, are differentiated by some aspect that's that's fundamental, that makes it possibly costly to move back and forth. And in the, in the, in the Rogers and Chimer Wright paper, there's a, the discussion is, is such that they kind of, they say that, and this is based on the, the Moen paper, um, there are three ways of doing this. I mean, you can think of firms posting the wages, what we observe. You can also think of a market maker, so you can think of brokers. The brokers would be like the intermediaries. So again, this is very, you know, we know that search models are very uh, general. So if you're looking for an apartment, um, you could literally knock on every door in a building and ask if the apartment is, is, is vacant. 
uh, it's probably not very efficient, so you contact someone who could give you some information because that person is a lightning rod for information from the other side. Right? We call that a broker, a person who makes the market. So the market maker approach is an alternative to the firms posting the wage. So you can think of a, maybe a headhunter uh, agency or something like that. And uh, you could also think of workers just naming their gig. Like, I'll work for you, but you have to pay me this much money. And we have the feeling that's, a, that's observed for certain types of occupations like, um, you know, DJs and clubs, <laughs> but not, not, or some really famous professors, but not necessarily for, for workers. So workers seem to have a, a disadvantage, maybe because of the, the size of the firm and the, the size of the workers' presence in the process. Uh, workers tend to get posted. They don't post. Okay. <laughs> so under certain conditions, you can show that these are actually the same, uh, but those are not always uh, going to be relevant for us. So but we'll stick to the case. I think it's the... And I like this because it, it reminds me a little bit of, of, of Pissarides. I mean, it's, it's actually very similar. Um, and that's why I'll use the notation. And unlike, um, unlike uh, Rogers and Chimer Wright, um, they um, will, will kind of go back and forth with this, 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 this notation. I'll use their notation in, the, in their paper, but I'll keep reminding you that it, it has, it has analogs that you, you studied at the very beginning of the, of the course when we, we talked about the Pissarides model. Okay, so there's some, you know, going back to the basics. <laughs> okay, so think of, think of the matching function. We're going to go back to the matching function and think of that as a primitive. So this is, again, the, the most recent research would try to figure out what is the matching function really about. I mean, um, is it about two people putting their hand in the urn at the same time, and maybe they you know, can pull out different balls, or they end up grabbing the same ball and, and they have to flip a coin. Okay, so you can, you can do some micro foundations of that, and we're not gonna do that, but you can. Uh, the matching function, as we remember, was criticized. Tomas probably told you about that. The matching function has a lot of empirical evidence for it, um, but it's not a complete story, and it's, a, it's, it's subject to the Lucas critique. Um, we tried to push the, the shape of the matching function into some, um, into some um, explanation that's exogenous. It's just given by people's traits, or the, but that's really not very satisfactory. So a lot of people have, have thought about maybe the urn model, visiting different, different uh, places randomly or, or intentionally, and then having some sort of selection process if people coincide, if you have two or three applicants for the same job, you end up having to flip a coin or something. Okay, so we'll, we'll just follow the, the, the paper in this case to get, to get ideas fixed, because it's already quite interesting. Um, if you think about the matching function, it implies this matching probability for workers and firms, and the firm's uh, matching probability is kind of a is a is a is uh, is linked in a very in a constant returns world in a very clear way with with the matching probability for the for the worker. So there, um, we we learned that already when we looked at about F and and Q, uh, the way they they kind of behave with respect to each other. So you can think of the matching probability for workers as as depending on this measure of labor market tightness. And the higher uh, theta, we called it theta, uh, V over U is, the higher the probability that workers get, a, get, a, get some sort of match. And the firms had the opposite problem. So Q for the firms is, is, um, is bad for the probability, okay? And it's in a way that's, that can be explained. If I know what the, the matching function is or if I know what alpha, the alpha function looks like for the, for the workers, I can derive it for the firms. Okay, so and if you remember the Pissarides notation, it was just like saying uh, alpha W is like the F, and it's increasing, and the uh, alpha F is the Q for the, for the firms. Now I'm gonna try to do what they do in the paper, which is to think of theta as not only a measure of, 
of labor market tightness, but it's a measure of the queue length. If you had to stand in line to get a, to get a, um, to get a shot at getting into the club, right? So I, think, I always think about clubs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How long do you have to wait in line to get in? Um, then it's going to be kind of an, a measure um, of this queue length will be an inverse of, the, of, the, of labor market tightness from the perspective of the unemployed workers, okay? Um, think of workers going to, to firms where the queue is shorter, ceteris paribus, holding the wage constant. But the wage will not be constant because the firms can adjust the wage in a, in a market. And we're going to assume that in the market, firms are like they have information over each other's behavior, but markets can be different across these borders that we haven't defined yet. But we're going to, you know, we're going to we're going to think about those as being sort of uh, they 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 raise this impervious inability to do both at the same time. So whatever it is, you can't you can't be active in one market and be active in, this, in the other at the same time. That's just an important assumption. And you know, in the, in the world of internet, it's not so defendable anymore, defensible as, a, as an assumption. Because you can actually, with a bot, you could probably act, be active in several markets at the same time. But this is ruled out. So firms can be actively searching in, a, in, a, um, in one market. And then if, if they are, they're not in, in the other. And workers basically understand that, and they line up to places where um, their expected utility is higher. So their expected utility has to be defined. That's just going to be simply in this one-shot model, which is the, the first shot at trying to tackle this problem, would be thinking about expected uh, utility. And for the, this worker, no risk aversion, the same sort of basic assumptions as before. We can add that, but um, the worker's just going to take a weighted average of getting the job at W in that particular submarket and uh, having to take unemployment benefits. Okay, so it's just a simple weighted average. And this is a classic assumption that's made in a lot of different models of efficiency wages. Um, I don't know if you remember the Stiglitz um, Shapiro Stiglitz model of, of um, shirking. Okay, the, the assumption is that the, 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 the collection of markets, the labor markets we observe, these sub-markets, basically offer uh, workers a certain level of utility. And in equilibrium, you'd expect these levels of utility to be kind of close to each other. So, and, and if they're not, then workers will leave the low utility labor market and go to the high utility labor market and, um, and vice versa. Okay, so you have kind of like an arbitrage condition. Workers are able to ex ante or ex post in any sense to make a choice that would gravitate towards equalizing these rates of, these levels of utility, expected utility, across markets. OK, so they call it expected income. I just call it utility, but it's, it's, it's the same thing in this model of risk neutrality. OK, and the firm, the firm can't change that. The firm can't uh, sort of you know, reduce. You, it's sort of a given to the firm. So if, you know, when, when you hear firms talk to each other, they say, oh, workers are so lazy nowadays, all these all the sort of uh, work-life balance and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of an indication that you bar, upper bar is rising um, relative to some good old days when workers were suffering and desperate to work. Now they're, now they're because they're, they're smaller, um, the, the supply is, is, uh, is, uh, is less abundant, then you, know, you, have to pay for it. you have to pay for it. And that means, it, so anyway, the, this U bar is given to the firms. The firms have to, in some sense, if they want to be competitive in any particular market, they have to offer this level of utility, which by arbitrage across the markets will be the same. So again, it's a really simple model. I think you should maybe look at the paper and the, the extensions are kind of interesting, but we'll, maybe we'll talk about them next week. But in any case, 
firms are, uh, are dealing with this U bar and it's this expected U income. And the, it's kind of a constraint. The firms actually cannot do what they want. I mean, a little bit like the Burdett Mortensen model where the, in equilibrium the firms have no ex ante reason to change their posting strategy given what the other guys are doing. It's the same thing here. Given what the other markets are offering, um, I'm happy to be posting W in this labor market. And this labor market, if I post a really high wage, you can imagine, you think you're gonna have a high or a low Q length. If it's a great club, <laughs> offers a high expected utility, you can have a high Q, right? So the, think of the, you know, the, the quality of the club uh, leads to large Qs uh, and you have to wait. So the workers, and again, you're visiting a club, if, if you have to wait too long, you go somewhere else, and then you stand in some other line, right? And then the, the longer the queue, the more the quality of the club, here, the higher the wage. Yeah. So does the no hard to trust condition here imply that uh, neither firms nor workers are intensified to change their stock market, like to jump up? Yeah, that's the, that's the implication of the equilibrium condition. But right now I'm just trying to describe the, the choices available. Um, but you're right, in the equilibrium, U bar will be the same because right now, you, we, you know, the, in, a, in a out of equilibrium situation, U bar um, might be sort of a certain subset of markets could have a very high U bar and the other might have a low U bar but there's something's wrong there, so people could, should start crossing that border, and then when they start doing that, that shows that it can't be an equilibrium. So an equilibrium, U-bar is the same. That's the idea. And they're, they're kind of thin on the, on the details, right? Because you need to have a good reason that there's a border. Why, why don't you just have one big club? Well, there's obviously a reason for that. You know, it's geographic, or it's just exogenous, uh, differentiation, I don't know. All these things have, are just given, taken as given. Okay. So the firm, in, in devising a strategy, because the firm now has, can decide before it enters the, any market, has to decide what wage do I post. And I know that if I post a high wage of in this market, um, I'm gonna have a long queue, but that's gonna hurt my profits. It's the same idea as before. It's very similar. Um, post a low wage, I'll have great profits, um, but um, the, the queue length will be very short and I will not be um, probably making many, much money. So now this is the expected utility condition on the, on the across markets for the, from the worker's perspective. The firm's perspective is what wage do I post and what consequences does that have for my expected profits. So it's kind of similar to what we did before. Um, not quite the same because that model didn't have um, this type of, um, of unemployment because this type of unemployment is not a, does not involve a reservation wage per se. It, re it involves queuing, involves congestion, the famous Pissarides unemployment. Remember the very first lecture we talked about the Pissarides model. We had this unemployment which is, is an outcome of the model and it's, um, you can't say it's, 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 you can't necessarily say it's inefficient without knowing the rest of, of what's going on but it's not like workers are actively turning down uh, offers. There's not a heterogeneous wage offer distribution in this, in this particular model. Okay, so now we're gonna assume that a firm has to pay a cost to enter the market. So this is kind of, this is kind of to prevent this sort of uh, um, moving back and forth in some way. So once you pay the cost, you're stuck. You're stuck in that market. And then in that, in that they're gonna assume basically every, all these markets have the same productivity. So you could also jazz up the model and have a, high productivity market, um, and then you'd have a different set of wage posts there probably um, related to that. I mean, these things are easy tweaks, but um, take the easy, easy model first. And the firms are all identical, so they just have to pay this fixed cost to enter a market. Okay, so 
one of many, and the firm solves that problem, choosing the wage and implicitly choosing the queue length because they know if they post a high wage, um, queue's gonna be high because they know that this constraint binds. Okay, so the, the second equation is the constraint. So you can set up a Lagrange uh, function, simple problem, or you can substitute directly, which is what I'm gonna do, because it makes it easier. Um, you don't have to carry around the Lagrange multiplier, it leads to the same outcome. <coughs> okay, so think of this as like a, um, a classic maximization under constraints. So the firm will, you know, will be thinking very hard about this as it moves um, into its choice of wages. So you can think of this as the choosing the wage and implying a Q length or choosing the Q length um, implying the wage. So this is the way they do it in the paper just to, just to um, make it easier for you to digest what they have in the paper. It's, it's very, it's, I think it's pretty easy to understand. You can write wages as a function of the Q length, so the firm basically chooses, chooses its Q length implicitly by choosing its wage, or choosing the Q length implies the wage. Now what's the cost of having a Q? Well, the Q means if the Q is long, I get lots of workers because the arrival rate is, I mean, just by the matching function, uh, this alpha um, F, which we called Q, so I'm using the Pizzarides notation, um, would be higher. Remember, firms like unemployment, so they like, they like going into markets where there's lots of unemployment because it's easier to get workers, but it has its cost. Okay, so here's the problem. Um, plug in for W, subtract the W. Remember, the, it's, it's a, it's a one-person match, uh, one, one person match, so it's really it's trivial. There's no concerns about marginal product of labor because there's only one worker. Okay, so the first order conditions, um, given U bar um, is the same for all the firms. So it pins down basically the, the relationship between U bar and W. So if you, if you substitute, you find that you substitute back, this optimal wage post um, is going to be a function of two things. It's going to be a function of the worker's opportunity cost of time, which we already have from way back. And then it's going to be a function of the, of the, the surplus. And this surplus is going to depend on, on basically the, the labor market tightness that's implied by, the, um, by that wage post. So you can look at, think of it as the optimal choice of theta implying W or optimal choice of W implying theta, they're identical. Okay, but there's a very special outcome here, um, which is this, this uh, relationship between the, the optimal wage post and the, the surplus available at the match. It's actually a function of the Q function. It's a function of the matching function. Because the firm, the firm knows that if it raises the wage a little bit, um, it changes the Q length and that changes the arrival rate. Okay, so if I, if I post a high wage, I'm gonna get lots of arrivals and uh, it's gonna hurt my profits, but I'm gonna get um, that, the, the higher arrivals is gonna hurt my, uh, um, is, I mean, having, if having a, um, a lower, a, um, a higher Q length will mean um, more, more arrivals of workers, more unemployed workers uh, looking for uh, a given number of vacancies. And that turns out that if, you know, that, that epsilon function is actually a function of this matching function. It turns out to be the elasticity of the matching function with respect to, to the labor market tightness term. Okay, so this is a really powerful result. This is the, this is kind of the aha moment, uh, connecting what we did before and what we did now. Because remember before, I think I told you, there's no reason, and I know, I know Thomas told you in the, in the section, there's no reason to think that the, in the Pissarides model, the Nash bargained wage leads to an efficient outcome. Okay? And this is the, kind of the reason why. 
because in the, the Nash is the split of the surplus. Remember that was, I don't know, what, what, what do we use for that? Was it beta? I used beta, I think. Okay. The bargaining power. So the, the Pizzeri's model would kick out the epsilon of theta star and put in beta. Beta is a, a bad symbol because it's usually our discount factor. <laughs> but in this case, it's the worker's bargaining power. And that was, uh, so this model says bargaining, Nash bargaining is not necessarily efficient. Okay, that's the aha moment. That was um, Hosios. Okay, the Hosios result, I'll, I'll call it that in a second. He basically showed that if you have this kind of world, um, the right split of the surplus has to be related to the, to the um, elasticity of the matching function with respect to tightness in the labor market. Okay, that's a requirement. Otherwise, you're, there are better sharing rules that would lead to more efficiency on one, one side or the other. So this is the, um, you know, this is kind of a, it's like a, it's <laughs> almost like a, like a first best type of prescription. And if you do the, if you think about the qualities of the matching function that we assumed from the very beginning, M of U and V, constant returns to scale, positive first derivatives, negative second derivatives, implying a positive cross derivative. Um, they imply that this epsilon will lie in the unit interval. Okay, so it's gonna, the model, if you believe the matching function and the queuing function is correct, it leads to this result. We have to respect that. And it has to do with the relative efficiency of, of presence in the labor market. Okay. You have a, you have a? Yeah, um, but so this outcome is efficient? This is efficient, yeah. So if beta is equal to epsilon, then in the Pizzeri's model, this will also be efficient. Right, that's right. Pizzeri's model, does it really matter what beta is? Isn't it just surplus that gets distributed either to the worker or to the firm? But it, do, it, really <coughs> it, it affects the entry behavior of firms. So the... Abundancy of, of vacancies will respond. And if, if profits uh, are too meager, then firms won't enter in an efficient way. Because the, the social planner would, would choose, the social planner would, would, would not pay a wage. It would just basically look at the efficiency of matching yeah. and try to decide how to <clears throat> optimize the amount of vacancies posted, given that vacancy posting costs something. And then... Um, lead to that outcome. Okay, so this is, this is uh, you know, again, just repeating. Um, just rewrite the first order condition and insert the constraint again at the optimum. So this is the optimum behavior of the firm. And workers basically get paid their fall, but if you rewrite the, the formulas before, workers get, they get B, and they get some um, piece of the piece of the action that depends on the elasticity of, of matching with respect to labor market um, tightness. So when, when when V over U is high, they get more. Okay, and and if workers don't have an endogenous. The only endogenous response here is that workers can can leave one labor market and go to another. It doesn't. It has. It, it's not part of their their optimal. Um, reservation wage strategy. There's no reservation wage strategy in this model. Right? We've, we've shut that down. You got a question? Yeah, I was wondering, so if, the, if firms post a higher wage, then there's a longer queue, which means the market from their perspective is tighter. No, no, I mean, it, no, there are more unemployed, there are more people waiting, so that means it increases their ability to recruit. Right? The longer the queue, it's the queue, it's the queue of workers for a vacancy. It's, it's, not, it's the inverse of V over U. So from the, from the firm's perspective, it's uh, less tight. Right, yeah, okay. right, exactly. The Q is, a, is an inverse measure of, the, of, of labor market tightness.
Well, the firm has the, the cost is the firm pays a higher wage, then it loses it loses some of its surplus to the to the firm to the worker. Sorry, so it's it's giving. I mean, it gets a higher Q, which is good for its finding probability, but it loses some profits. That's the trade-off. Yeah. Uh, I was just relating to this question about uh, if the epsilon of theta would equal theta, but would that require like I mean? Well, in the Pizzeria's model, we just assume beta. That was just an assumption, exactly, right? Exactly. Yes, but like if we, um, if yeah. From the monetary perspective, they always talk about this beta and this Arrhenius model should be equal to one in order to achieve efficiency. No, 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 not, not, not equal to one. Yeah, it's just like the buyer should have all the bargaining power. One of the eight, one of, like either the, 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 the firm or the worker should have all the bargaining power to achieve the highest efficiency possible, which but is not this, the case in um, directed matching. That's why they think that directed matching is more of a more yields more efficient outcome. It, it's it's not it, it would be never that like the the epsilon of theta would equal to beta in a sort of say because epsilon of theta here yields an efficient outcome which mm. is less than one. It's between zero and one. Right, right, right. The other one, in order to achieve the highest efficiency possible or like the first best, one of the I. Yeah, like in monetary models are the buyers, which I think in the firms, in the labor uh, model. It depends on the rest of the model. It depends on if there's any heterogeneity around involved, and, and who's doing the searching, mm -hmm. and who's doing the queuing. I think those things are absolutely important. Here the firms are posting the wage, and then the queues are formed by the workers. Um, and the... the um, I think in the, in the end, the firm, the firms, uh, you know, it depends on the assumptions we make. It's like, just like the assumption with the with the previous model, where the all the heterogeneity was in the workers' end, and the firm had a constant marginal product of labor. And the efficient the the efficient solution would be the the, the firm should post uh, a wage that gives all the surplus to the worker, and maybe some tax could claw it back if you thought it was unfair to the to the capitalists. But it's a, it's a um, it, it depends on wh where the where the for the queues are forming and who's making the, the decision to stand in line. And here we have a free entry condition for the for the firm, so the these vacancies arise because of excessive profits or sub you know subnormal profits lead to end to exit and you have entry. But the but the workers are standing in line. The workers are standing in line for the firm. So I, I think you could probably rig a model that would give you exactly the opposite conclusions than the ones you said. Um, but um, I'll think about it and we'll come back to it, okay? Because it's, it's a good question. Um, I know you're thinking about the monetary model application. <laughs> okay, so um, let's, let's think about this a little bit more. And, and I'm, I'm running out of time. So in a competitive search uh, model, we have a wage that kind of splits the surplus. And the split has to be, and, and the point is, this is not a planner's problem. This is a competitive model. So the, the firms are competing with each other, setting the, the wage post subject to this constraint, and we get the Hosios condition. So it's kind of a special, remember Pissarides, you didn't, it was like a coin flip. I mean, if beta were equal to the, to the epsilon of the, of the matching function, then you get efficiency, but there's no reason that should happen, right? But in this model, behavior of, of firms posting wages and workers' ability to, to leave markets that are not giving enough utility or not expected income lead to this result where the firms actually post a wage, um, have a wage post in equilibrium that reflects the Hosios condition. So that was Mohn's uh, contribution back then. Okay, so that's a, um, epsilon is given, it's given by this, by this queuing function, which is related to the matching function. So in the Cobb-Douglas case, it's constant. Right, so we have Cobb-Douglas matching, epsilon is constant, it's independent of theta. Okay, so there's, um, I mean, it's not clear, 
you um, I mean, again, it's a, uh, exactly in the case where Pisarides doesn't work because there's a Nash bargaining rule, it would work in this case. You'd end up getting this constant split, which would be equal to the, um, the Cobb-Douglas elasticity. Now, in general, uh, production functions don't have to be Cobb-Douglas. They, they could be trans log, and then you could have some, some sensitivity of the elasticity of substitution to, to the quantities of unemployment and vacancies. But we still have this nice result. Um, and the higher the, this E, this elasticity with respect to uh, um, the Q length with respect to vacancies, um, the higher the wage is going to be. So labor market tightness um, falls sharply in re response to a posted vacancy. And it's a little bit like the elasticity of labor supply in the classic monop monopsy model, in my view. Okay, so it's a, um, having a really high, um, higher value of epsilon would give more uh, surplus to the, to the workers. Okay, so again, you might say this is kind of a rinky-dink model because in a sense, free entry, constant returns to scale, and arbitrage are kind of heavy, heavy assumptions to make, okay? But it shows you how powerful competition can be. So we want to, I mean, for me, the fundamental model message is we want to have more competition. We want to give work, we want to empower workers to leave. We don't want to have non-compete agreements you know, for McDonald's workers. That's ridiculous. You want to empower workers to give them a chance to, to move to other markets where conditions are better and not try to, employers, of course, want to lock workers in. They want to restrict competition and shut, set up you know, barriers as much as they can. So it's kind of going back to the original message. So again, this result is what the central planner would choose. And this is called the Hosios condition. It doesn't involve any Nash bargaining. It's just an outcome, right? So that was a really powerful result. It was in the Journal of Political Economy, a very nice, nice, nice contribution. And it also serves as a warning that if we do have Nash bargaining, suppose we have labor unions and firms negotiating, then um, the outcome may not be efficient for that reason because it doesn't, it doesn't affect, it doesn't reflect all the important considerations that would result from a model that was broadly considering, um, or a, a broad consideration of all the interests in, in effect. So competition kind of enforces a lot more interest especially the interests of the unemployed. I think that's one kind of one, one nice com sum summary of the, of the model. And under certain conditions, you can get this result under different types of posting behavior. So if you read the paper, um, they talk about that a little bit. And um, you can even introduce brokers, right? So you can imagine maybe, maybe firms don't post wages, but they hire competitive firms to go around spreading the news creating sub-markets, uh, conveying information in some way. Um, OK, so I'm done. Anyway, you have a question? Can I give my question on other goals? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I hope, <laughs> hope I can answer it. <laughs> Yeah, the, the worker would, would stick, stay, if the wage post is too low relative to the Q length, because the, the worker hasn't, the, the, the constraint for the firm is that expected income has to be the same across markets. So a low wage post means uh, lower expected income. And if the Q is um, shorter, then I'll get my job, but I won't have much of it. I mean, it won't, won't give me very much income. <laughs> So I'll probably move away from that market until in expected value terms, that expected income is the same as in the market next door, which pays a little bit higher wage, maybe has a little bit longer waiting queue. And, and you, can, it, it, you can think of this as, as, as drawing an ISO, it's like an ISO quant, but it's an ISO utility curve. All the combinations of labor market tightness and wages that give the same level of utility. So any labor market has to be on that ISO 
utility, ISO expected wage, expected income curve. Okay, that's, 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 that's a nice way of thinking about it. That's the constraint the firms have to, and again, this model is so simple, all the, all the sub-markets end up looking the same. Sub-market is just a construct to get the competition in there. Yeah? Which paper again was the curves? They're referenced in the, in the Rogerson Chimer Wright paper, and in, in Moon, they, he talks about it. But that's an older paper, but there are lots of other papers that have come afterwards. So we can talk about it. I can maybe give you some references. Okay, key concepts. Um, yeah. Uh, think about frictions, think about heterogeneity and matching. Uh, we didn't talk about firm heterogeneity too much, but um, you could certainly, you can work through the model, this model. And then we finished up talking about competitive search and the Hosios condition. Okay, so have a great week and I'll see you next time. Thank you.